Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be products designed to work with dedicated outdoor air systems. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. Later I'll be joined by David Pick and Giannis Rosenbergs for the question and answer portion of today's program. David is our Director of HVAC Technology and comes to Titus with over 17 years of project experience as a consulting engineer. Giannis is our product manager for chilled beams, fan coils, and a few other related products. You may submit your questions at any time and we will answer them for the benefit of all at the conclusion of our webcast. Although this webcast is titled Dedicated Outdoor Air Systems, we'll actually be covering a variety of products primarily designed to work with these systems. We'll start with a very brief overview of dedicated outdoor air systems and then we'll look at specific products and how they are applied. We'll cover active beams, floor mounted active beams, and series fan powered terminals with sensible cooling coils. I want you to know that our purpose today is not to sell any technology as being superior to all other technologies. Buildings come in all shapes and sizes and are designed for many different purposes. These factors, together with climate conditions and energy, must be taken into consideration before designing any system. It's often necessary to create multiple preliminary designs in order to decide on the best final design path. We simply want to explain the advantages and disadvantages of each technology so that the designer can make informed decisions regarding system choices. Now let's start with a look at dedicated outdoor air systems, or DOAS, as they are commonly referred to in our industry. More and more buildings are being designed with dedicated outdoor air systems and for good reason. DOAS, when properly applied, can provide superior ventilation while controlling mold and humidity for improved indoor environmental quality and increased energy efficiency. Although DOAS doesn't rely on any new technology, it uses conventional equipment in a system that's configured differently from a traditional all-air VAV system. DOAS handles outdoor air separately from return air, so it requires two separate sets of equipment. By splitting the equipment function in this way, DOAS effectively separates the sensible and latent loads so that they can be handled more efficiently. Rather than handle ventilation and air conditioning with a single unit, the DOAS Outdoor Air Unit controls humidity by removing the latent load from ventilation air, while the DOAS Return Air Unit removes the sensible load to control temperature. The DOAS Outdoor Air Unit can also help to remove any latent load generated within the building by simply providing ventilation air that is drier than the desired humidity level. In most climates, the DOAS Outdoor Air Unit cools and dehumidifies in the summer and either heats or cools during the winter season. This unit typically requires a filter bank, a preheating coil, a cooling coil, a reheating coil, and a humidifier. Energy recovery is highly recommended and is typically handled by latent and sensible energy wheels to transfer heat and moisture between exhaust and intake air. As you can see in this diagram, outdoor air first passes through a filter. It is then often preheated in cold climates to prevent frost from forming on the energy wheel. Energy wheel number one brings the outdoor air closer to the temperature and humidity of the exhaust before it is cooled and dehumidified by the cooling coil. Energy wheel number two is then used to make a final temperature adjustment to prevent overcooling of the ventilation air. You might ask yourself why anyone would choose DOAS if it requires additional equipment. The main reason would be that DOAS uses energy more efficiently, followed closely by DOAS provides improved indoor environmental quality. A study conducted by the U.S. Department of Energy uh, compares, comparing DOAS to conventional VAV systems showed reduced energy usage for both heating and cooling, but no real savings on fan energy. The researchers based their conclusions on the assumptions that DOAS reduced the ventilation requirement by 20 percent, 
that outdoor air accounted for 50% of the heating load and 25% of the cooling load, and that the coefficient of performance for the return air compressor was increased by 20% due to an 11 degree Fahrenheit increase in evaporator temperature. To summarize, dedicated outdoor air systems treat outdoor air and return air separately in order to handle sensible and latent loads more efficiently. They remove moisture from the ventilation air to reduce building humidity levels and allow a secondary system to handle the sensible loads. Energy recovery in the form of sensible and latent heat wheels is strongly recommended to further improve system efficiency. And all this adds up to potential improvements in building comfort as well as energy savings. Now let's look at products that are frequently applied to DOAS. Let's start with active chilled beams. We're going to look at active beams because unlike passive beams, active beams are supplied with both water and air. Although the air doesn't necessarily have to be supplied by a DOAS, it usually is. Active beams come in a myriad of designs, but the most typical design is a two-way linear type capable of providing both heating and cooling along with ventilation air to an occupied space. So let's see how these units are constructed. Regardless of manufacturer, most active beams contain common construction features. There's a primary air inlet that could be tapped into the top, side, or end of the unit. There's a primary air plenum that will be pressurized. In addition, a pressure tap is often provided to allow the balancer to determine the primary air volume based on the static pressure in the plenum. The plenum will also be fitted with a series of discharge nozzles. The bottom center section is typically covered with a louvered or perforated face that will allow return air motion while blocking the view to the coil. There will also be a coil designed for either a two-pipe or four-pipe water connection depending on whether the unit will handle cooling, heating, or both. And finally, there will be one or more discharge slots running the length of the unit on one side or both sides. So now let's see how active beams work. Cool, dry air, typically 63 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, is supplied to the internal plenum of an active beam. This primary air then discharges through a series of nozzles creating induction. As room air is entrained by the discharge jet of the active beam, this induced air is drawn up through the beam where it is heated or cooled, mixed with primary air, and then discharged into the room. It's important to understand that the total air volume discharging from a well-designed active beam will be much higher than the primary air volume supplied by the DOAS. This is due to high induction of room air. Most active beams produce induction ratios of two to three times the primary air volume. Higher induction ratios may be possible, but are generally limited by inlet pressure requirements and the resulting noise levels. So you might ask yourself, why active beams? The main reason would be to take advantage of the efficiency of water for heating and cooling. Water has a volumetric heat capacity that's 3,500 times greater than air. This means that we can use a small water line to replace a much larger duct. In fact, a one inch water pipe can supply as much heating and cooling capacity as an 18 by 18 inch air duct. Obviously, we still need to provide ventilation air, but the ductwork can be greatly reduced in size if it no longer has to handle the heating and cooling requirements. It also takes far less energy to move water through a pipe than it does to move air through a duct. A water pump can move the same amount of thermal energy as a fan, but at about one-seventh the operating cost. But what about ventilation? Obviously, a conventional mixed air system with overhead diffusers can be designed to meet the ventilation needs of a space, but it can't do it in the most efficient way. In order to meet the heating and especially the cooling requirements, the air volume supplied must be high enough to handle the loads. This volume is often much higher than is actually required to meet ventilation requirements, so it results in wasted energy when only ventilation is required. 
and any subcooling that occurs must be overcome by reheating the space. This is also wasted energy. The coils inside active beams should only be used for sensible heating and cooling. They can be used to raise or lower the air temperature of a room, but they cannot remove moisture from room air. Humidity reduction is a latent process that involves condensation. Since a chilled beam is located in a room at or near the ceiling level, it doesn't lend itself to condensate piping. Besides, the idea of locating numerous condensate pans immediately above occupied spaces is very unappealing to most designers and should be avoided. So how do chilled beam systems address latent loads? It's handled by the supply air. Cool, dry air is supplied by the air handler or DOAS and condensate is removed at the cooling unit. This means that the air volume supplied is often much less than in a conventional system with overhead diffusers because it only has to meet the ventilation and latent heat removal requirements. This results in smaller ductwork and lower system static pressures. Now let's look at temperatures. In a typical office situation, the desired room temperature is 72 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. In a conventional system with an air handler and overhead diffusers, the supply air for cooling is 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, and the supply air for heating is 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If the supply air must be reheated at a terminal unit by means of a hydronic coil, it would typically be supplied with 180 degree water. In a chilled beam system, the same office would be supplied with 63 to 68 degree air. This air could be generated by mixing 50 to 55 degree air with return air at a conventional air handler, or the air could be supplied by a DOAS. At the active beam, sensible cooling would be handled by 55 to 63 degree water, and sensible heating would require a temperature not to exceed 140 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to keep our cooling process sensible, it is critical that we prevent condensation from occurring on the beams. If we follow ASHRAE guidelines for good indoor air quality, we should keep the relative humidity of the room air below 60%. Most buildings operate at 50 to 55% relative humidity. For a room temperature of 72 to 74 degrees, this corresponds to a dew point temperature of roughly 52 to 57 degrees. In order to prevent condensation, it's generally recommended that supply water temperatures should be 3 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit above dew point. So our minimum water temperature should be roughly 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, all active beams require control systems capable of monitoring water temperatures and room conditions so that valves serving individual zones will shut down to prevent condensation before it has a chance to occur. It has been pointed out to me that for all the concern and warnings about condensation on chilled beam products, it is actually very rare that it occurs. I don't honestly know whether this is a testament to the skills of the controls industry or proof that people have heeded all the warnings. I really don't care. I'll take it either way. So to summarize, active beams take advantage of the efficiency of water versus air to handle sensible heating and cooling loads in the room. Latent loads are handled by ventilation air and the air supplied to the room is reduced because it isn't required for sensible loads. Air motion and circulation within the room is maintained through the induction created by the nozzles in the beam. As we discussed, room conditions must be accurately monitored and controlled to prevent condensation from forming on active beams. The control systems must be capable of shutting off water to any room before condensation appears. Now let's look at some hybrid products starting with floor mounted active beams. Several products have emerged over the years to handle the specific needs of classroom environments. Classrooms typically have perimeter glass running along one or more sides that may require heating in colder climates, but have high occupancy in the interior requiring simultaneous cooling. In addition, to create a good learning environment, these spaces should provide high thermal comfort and low room sound levels. In order to meet these requirements, 
hybrid products that combine active beam technology with displacement ventilation have been developed and successfully applied. Although there is not yet an industry standard uh, technology for referring to these products, we'll refer to them as floor-mounted active beams. Floor-mounted active beams can provide a displacement ventilation style air pattern by delivering supply air, typically from a DOAS, that is cooler than the desired room temperature. This cool air discharges at low velocity and cascades down to the floor where it spreads across the room. This cold air is drawn by convection to any sources of heat in the interior and forms a vertical plume that carries heat and pollutants to the ceiling where it leaves the room through the return grill. This type of ventilation is very different from a conventional fully mixed system and is referred to as a stratified system. Properly designed stratified systems are known for producing high comfort, reduced ventilation requirements, and improved indoor environmental quality. Floor mounted active beams are not all identical in design. They employ different induction nozzle arrangements to pull room air through their coils and their outlet locations can result in differing air patterns. The unit depicted is designed to provide the most useful air patterns and functionality in my opinion. If we start with the face panel, you can see that it's perforated to allow room air to be induced through two different coils, each serving a different air path. The lower coil is used for cooling. Room air passing through this coil is mixed with air from the DOAS before discharging from the lower portion of the face to create a displacement ventilation pattern. This air will project across the room at floor level to handle interior loads. The upper coil is used for heating. Room air passing through this coil is mixed with air from the DOAS before discharging from the grill on top of the cabinet to create a vertical air pattern. This air will treat the area just inside the perimeter glass to neutralize exterior loads. It's important to note that all air motion is generated by DOAS air pressurizing the primary air plenum and discharging through multiple nozzles to create room air induction. Lack of integral fan power means low sound levels and no moving parts, but it also requires that the building systems be in operation at all times to condition the space. And here's a cutaway drawing showing in detail the various air paths through this floor mounted active beam. Although it may seem like a costly diffuser to those unfamiliar with these products, it actually does much more. Like many air outlets, it creates room air entrainment through induction. So for a given amount of ventilation air supplied by the DOAS, the floor mounted active beam creates a lot of low velocity room air motion and circulation. Some of this room air is induced through the cooling coil before mixing with ventilation air to create displacement ventilation for the interior spaces. Other air is induced through the heating coil before mixing with ventilation air to create a vertical air pattern. Although this mixed air should be sufficient to neutralize the glass during warm weather, it can be heated to handle cold weather conditions as well. Here's an example of a system using floor mounted active beams supplied by a DOAS to handle a room with perimeter glass on both sides. We have used computational fluid dynamic software to help visualize what happens in a room served by a floor mounted active beam. Now let's look at the CFD model. The CFD model was based on a typical classroom with perimeter glass along one wall. The floor mounted active beam was centered in a sill beneath the glass. Heat loads representing the occupants were dispersed about the interior of the room and the return air grill was located in an interior corner just as you would expect. And here is the result of the design cooling simulation. As you can see, the floor mounted beam is discharging a cool mixture of air from the DOAS and room air in a vertical pattern to neutralize the perimeter glass load. You can also clearly see the cold mix of air from the DOAS and room air that was cooled by the beam extending into the interior of the room. The displacement ventilation air pattern is achieving good projection as it is drawn towards the simulated student loads. 
The dashed line indicating the head level of the students is effectively the top of the occupied zone. Note the much warmer air at the ceiling level. This is typical for displacement cooling or any fully stratified air distribution system. Return air temperatures are higher because air volume requirements are lower, but the same amount of heat is being removed from the room. In the heating mode, you might notice that the ceiling temperatures are much different. And here's the result of the design heating simulation. As you can see, the floor mounted beam is still providing displacement ventilation cooling to the interior of the room, but now we've got heating in the vertical pattern. The floor mounted beam is drawing room air through the upper heating coil, mixing it with air from the DOAS, and this creates the vertical jet that neutralizes the cold glass on the perimeter. As you can see, there's not nearly as much heat at the ceiling as we saw in the cooling simulation because we're not taking as much heat out of the room. It's also important to remember the systems such as these operating at moderate water temperatures are ideal for making use of geothermal sources of cooling. So to summarize, floor mounted active beams are ideally suited to the needs of the classroom environment and are often supplied by DOAS to further increase system efficiency. They can provide a displacement ventilation air pattern for improved comfort and indoor environmental quality while reducing airflow requirements due to increased ventilation effectiveness. They neutralize the perimeter glass load by means of a secondary air path that can both heat and cool. Since they have no moving parts and include no blower assembly, they're quiet and require minimal maintenance. They are also well suited to geothermal applications. Our next so-called hybrid product is a series fan powered terminal with a sensible coil. Some people have gone so far as to call this type of product a fan assisted chilled beam, but I think it's more confusing than simply calling it what it is. It's a series fan powered terminal with a sensible coil. This product has a combination of features that could also be met by a room fan coil with a VAV fresh air inlet, but most manufacturers are offering a product that's a variation on a low profile series fan terminal. This probably comes from the fact that the first projects to use this product were in the Washington DC area, which is a low profile market. I expect at some point to see these units available in standard height casings as the market grows and higher capacities are required. Now let's look at the construction features. As you can see, it's a series fan powered terminal. As such, its fan runs continuously throughout the occupied mode to deliver ventilation. It's important to note that no air can be delivered if the unit fan isn't running. It just isn't possible because the pressure drop created by a non-operating forward curved blower simply causes any air supplied by the air handler to follow the path of least resistance and spill out of the induction port into the ceiling plenum. Units like these are typically going to include an ECM as standard equipment for a couple of reasons. Besides the fact that ECMs use far less energy and have much longer service lives than PSC motors, ECMs also lend themselves to remote speed control. This allows the ECM to adjust the amount of return air being drawn in through the sensible coil to mix with air from the DOAS. It's also important to know that building systems using series fan powered terminals should be sequenced to turn the unit fans on before the main building fans start. This prevents the possibility of unit fans running backwards. These units have a primary inlet duct to receive air from a DOAS. This air must be sufficient to meet the ventilation requirements as well as handle the latent loads in the space. The primary inlet has a control damper and an inlet velocity probe to regulate the amount of ventilation air provided to the zone. The side of the unit's been opened up to create an oversized induction port to, to accommodate a multi-row sensible coil. This coil can be a two pipe or four pipe type connection, depending on whether it'll provide cooling only or heating and cooling. The coil will typically have fewer fins per inch than a standard coil in addition to having expanded face area.
to keep face velocities and air pressure drops as low as possible. The sensible coil can also be provided with a drip pan. Optional return air filters can be provided on these units or filter grills can be installed in the ceiling. Filter grills in the ceiling are preferred when return air will be ducted from the space. The unit depicted also includes an optional electric coil on the discharge. This is a possibility for anyone who wants it, but I don't really expect to see much need for it. So we've looked at the features, now let's run through exactly what it does. Let's assume that we're supplying air from a DOAS, hot water from a high efficiency condensing boiler, and cold water from a dedicated chiller. This would be the most energy efficient system. When the room temperature is satisfied, the ECM moves the required ventilation air from the inlet to the diffusers of the room. The ventilation air requirement could be variable based on occupancy or CO2 levels. On a call for cooling, the ECM increases its speed and begins drawing more return air from the room through the sensible coil. A control valve regulates the cold water flow to cool the return air before it mixes with the ventilation air and is delivered to the room. On a call for heating, the ECM will adjust its speed to a design heating flow rate and draw warm return air from the space as a form of free heat. If additional heat is required, a control valve regulates the hot water flow to the coil. During unoccupied periods when the air handling equipment isn't running, this unit can come on to maintain night setback temperatures so long as the necessary waterside equipment is operating. This capability is one of the major benefits of using fan-powered terminals on perimeter zones. Here is a typical active beam system served by a DOAS. As you can see, there are typically many active beams required in order to handle the cooling load. There's also a need for water piping to each active beam, and this could involve both cold water and hot water depending on the application. We're only showing cold water in this diagram. And of course, water valves will be required to provide control to each individual zone. Now compare this diagram to the following diagram. Here is a typical system for a series fan powered terminal with sensible coil. You can see why some engineers consider this to be a much more attractive scenario than active beams. Water piping goes to a single location rather than multiple locations. There's also something reassuring about having a drip pan under the coil. Although these units should never intentionally condense, a drip pan like this provides additional protection from water damage in the event of a control or system failure. Something I really like about this system is that you have a choice of any diffusers you might want to use. So if you need a diffuser to create a particular air pattern or an outlet device that can blend into a particular architectural context, the possibilities are really unlimited. With active beams, you're often limited to a linear ceiling mounted diffuser. And as you can see, the return air path includes the option of a filter on the return air, unlike active beam systems. So you can see why the series fan powered terminal with sensible coil may be a good alternative to active beams. Although they're typically supplied by a DOAS and take advantage of the efficiency of water to handle sensible loads just like an active beam, they are more flexible and less plumbing is required. They also allow the designer to choose from the wide range of air outlets that most manufacturers offer in order to create the ideal air pattern or to complement the architectural style of a project. Optional drip pans provide additional insurance against possible water damage in the event of an operating problem or equipment failure. And return air can be filtered for improved indoor environmental quality. Hopefully we've been able to provide a useful overview of several products that are often applied to dedicated outdoor air systems. It's always a challenge to go deep enough to explain the material without talking so long that you lose your audience. That's why we try to keep these short. Anyone interested in more information regarding chilled beams and displacement ventilation should check out previous webcasts that you'll find archived on our website. That concludes our program today. 
We thank you for spending this time with us and hope that you, this material will benefit you in your professional endeavors. We will continue to produce more programs covering other HVAC topics and hope that you'll join us. Our panel will now begin answering questions that came in during the program. If you have any questions, please enter them in the box on the right side of your screen. Thank you.